There. There was a uh, mother who was preparing pancakes one day for her two young sons. Boys named uh, Kevin and Ryan, in fact. And the boys began to argue over who was going to get the very first pancake. Because you know that first pancake, it's got that perfect, you know. If your mom was like my mom, she had the electric griddle, put the butter on there first, right? And that made that very first one a little extra crispy. Anybody else like the crispy edged pancakes? Oh yeah, oh yeah, you're talking my love language there. I love that, good stuff. So, so the boys begin to argue, you know, Kevin and Ryan, they're arguing which one they're gonna get. And, and, and mom, of course, sees this as an opportunity for a parenting moment. So, so she says to the boys who are sitting there kind of at the table arguing, and she says, boys, if, if Jesus were sitting here, he would say, let your brother have the first pancake. Now I can wait, boys. Kevin kind of had a little thought, and you could see it in his eyes, and he turned and looked at his younger brother, and he said, Ryan, you be Jesus. (laughs) How many people know it's hard not getting what you want, right? And that's what this series we've been talking about is kind of all about. Wanting what God wants more than what we want. And come on, if, if, if we're honest, sometimes we do want that first pancake, don't we? Especially if we can get some of Raleigh's syrup on it, right? If you've not had Raleigh's syrup, you're missing out on one of the wonders of the world. Raleigh makes an amazing syrup, so uh, get some of it if you ever get a chance. Well, we've been talking about obedience and trusting God the last few weeks. And the very first week, we learned that obedience is a choice that I make when I don't want to do something. You see, we have to learn to trust God because He always, no matter what, wants what is best for you and me. Okay? And trust is a difference maker, we've learned. Trust makes or breaks a relationship. And that's true with God as well. And then last week, um, we learned that It is after we are obedient, then it is there that we will find God's blessing. But it has to come in that order, right? Our obedience has to lead before we experience God's blessing. And the truth of the matter, and what we talked about an awful lot, was that that can be scary. But we have to push through our fears and trust God. We have to have mustard seed moments in our lives where our faith, it may still be small... But our God is so big. And we put our hope and trust in Him and not in ourselves and our own doing. And so that even when we are afraid of what God might be calling us to, we can push through that fear and be obedient. And that, of course, then brings us to this week. And this week, we're going to be talking about prayer again. Yes, prayer. It does seem to come up a lot, doesn't it? We started off the year in 21 days of prayer. But we talk about prayer a lot because prayer is important. It's critical to our faith walk. You see, prayer is the the linchpin that makes obedience possible. It, it, It gets us to the place where we can finally honestly say, God, I want what you want. The other day I was doing some reading, and and I read some examples of some young kids' attempts to say the Lord's Prayer. Now, our students have memorized this, and we got to hear them say that, and and, and I was reading through these, and some of these were were pretty funny, frankly, and I want to read a few of them back to you. Uh, The first one was a young child, three-year-old named Reese, and and Reese tried to pray the Lord's Prayer and said, Our Father, who does art in heaven, Howard is his name, right? (laughs) It was a good effort. And then there was a four-year-old who prayed this. And forgive us our trash baskets as we forgive those who put trash in our baskets. Right? And, and, and one of my favorite ones is, comes from a three-year-old little girl named Caitlin. And she had practiced and practiced and practiced the Lord's Prayer, repeating it over and over again with her dad, day and night basically, until she felt she was finally ready to do it on her own. And, and, and everything was going exceptionally well until the very, very end where she said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from email. (laughs) Right? Now, we do maybe want to be delivered from email, but that's different. But the prayer can be challenging as a kid. But how many people know that it doesn't seem to be necessarily all that much easier for us as adults sometimes, does it? You know, I felt that way about prayer for a lot of my early spiritual Christian walk. 
I spent many hours basically just posturing, but, but never really praying. praying. And it wasn't, it wasn't until I, I really learned that the purpose of prayer was actually to change me, and it wasn't until then that I learned that prayer was to change me, that I began to have a fulfilling prayer time and prayer life. And there are moments in life when it's, it doesn't, it's not simply enough just to pray. You have to pray through something. Everybody say, pray through. Pray through, right? See, if obedience were easy, everybody would be doing it, right? We can talk about obedience all day long. But the truth is, when it comes to obeying God, uh, sometimes, sometimes when it comes to obeying God, it seems the hardest thing to possibly do for us is to pray for what God wants for us. You see, maybe God wants you to turn the other cheek, right? And nothing inside of you wants to put up with that ever again. Nothing inside of you ever wants to subject yourself to something that might hurt you once again. It's only prayer that could possibly allow you to obey. It was April 16th. 1963, when Martin Luther King Jr. wrote his famous letter. It's called Letter from a Birmingham Jail. You see, 13 days earlier, he and the leaders of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights had started their nonviolent protests with coordinated marches, with sit-ins uh, to fight segregation and racial injustice throughout Birmingham, Alabama. And when Judge Jenkins ruled against demonstrating on April 10th, it took only two days for King and his other leaders to be arrested and jailed. While he was sitting there in jail, King wrote about his personal struggle of forgiving the very police officers who had and were currently uh, assaulting his followers literally right outside of the jail, beating them with nightsticks, right? Calling them profane names. King, King wrote from that jail cell how he had to, to fast for several days before he could find the supernatural strength to be able to forgive the offenders. On his own, he said, he couldn't compel himself to forgive. He needed God's help. And so, maybe like King, it's, it's needing to love your enemy or forgive someone. Maybe for you it could be trusting God for a miracle that seems beyond impossible. There are all kinds of areas in our lives where we need help trusting and obeying, where we need the help for the strength that it requires for us to obey God. And that strength is only found through the secret of praying through. Mother Teresa once wrote, Praying is not asking. Prayer is putting oneself in the hands of God at His disposition, and then listening to His voice in the depths of our hearts. It's what King David described in Psalm 62.8, where he wrote, O my people, trust in Him, trust in God at all times. Pour out your heart to Him, for God is our refuge. You see, praying through is the process of pouring your heart out in confession to God, admitting that you have doubts and that you are selfish, and then allowing God to to fill you with the peace that surpasses all understanding. Until the, the moment where you are able to say, I want what God wants more than what I want. You see, even... Even Jesus had to pray his way through. Do you know that? Here's a promise. If Jesus had to pray his way to obedience, then you will too. Imagine knowing the very purpose of your life before you were even born, right? Imagine living your life 
for a single purpose that you are always aware of. And on the night in which your destiny begins, uh, your destiny awaits you on this very final night, you, you start to get cold feet. And that's where Jesus found himself on his knees in the Garden of Gethsemane. A story many of us are very familiar with. It was the greatest heavyweight battle of wills the world has ever seen. Let me read this to you. It comes from Matthew 26, 36 through 44. There are Bibles in the chairs. You can open your phone to an version or whatever you've got. And in Matthew 26, 36 through 44, it says, Then Jesus, with his disciples, they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet, Not as I will, but as you will. Then Jesus returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for just one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Then Jesus went away a second time and he prayed. My Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When Jesus came back again, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and he went away once more and he prayed a third time saying the same thing. You see, even Jesus had to pray through. And if he had to, so will we. But we know the rest of the story, don't we? You see, Jesus was obedient. And on the other side of that obedience by Jesus came blessing. Blessing for you and for me. Thank you, Jesus. How many of you know who Bob Ross was? Right? You can see his picture there. I love Bob Ross. I'll talk about Bob Ross anytime you want to talk about Bob Ross, right? Bob Ross had this painting show for many, many years on PBS, and and, and it's still occasionally on on PBS, and you can watch it on the internet pretty much any time you might possibly ever want to watch it. And if you've ever seen Bob Ross paint, you, you know how he worked, right? For the first 25 or so minutes of the show, his canvas it kind of looked like a mess, right? He would take different colors and you know, he, he would do his thing and he would paint kind of these, these abstract shapes that didn't necessarily always look like anything whatsoever. But then all of a sudden he would pick up a brush or even sometimes used his finger or he used these knives that he would paint with. And, and, and with one or two little strokes, the painting would begin to all come together. A, a little green mess with one little addition would turn into a, a beautiful forest, or a little gray blob would become a, a breathtaking mountain, and then you would begin to see this picture that he was painting crystal clear. And I think that God paints an awful lot like Bob Ross. Very few times in my life have I been able to recognize the work that was in progress in my life, and in the moment, The instruction of God seemed trivial or too difficult or I just couldn't see what he was painting. And you see, my problem is I want to see the finished product before I'm willing to participate. But that's not the way that God works, folks. If I agree to take the the first step and trust him, by the time that God is finished, He will have produced something that is beautiful. It's always obvious as we look back in hindsight, but it's incredibly frightening in the moment. Philip Yancey says that that faith is believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. 
faith is believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. You see, the Bible is filled with masterpieces, right? Men and women whose canvases took a lifetime to create, a lifetime to complete. If you were an art appraiser, imagine looking at the painting of Moses, right? The first 80 years kind of looked like dogs playing poker before it turned into a Mona Lisa. God wasn't finished with him. Joseph, right? Joseph had to wait 22 years for his paint to dry. Betrayal, abandonment were just some of the Almighty's choice of colors for his life. And at each fork in the road, Joseph had to recommit to God's plan, even when it wasn't clear what God was up to. Now, in full disclosure, I'm not an artist. I'm married to an art teacher, but I'm not an artist. Don't get me wrong. I love to paint, right? I'm just terrible at it. If you have painting skills that are beyond the level of third grade finger painting, you've got me beat. I'm not good. But I enjoy it. And I enjoy art in general, right? But I'm that guy that, like, I stare at these paintings, famous works or whatever, looking at them like I kind of understand what they're doing there, right? No clue. None. Don't get it. Don't understand it. Spiritually, though, once I started thinking about God as the painter and my, my life as the canvas, my perspective began to change. I began to reread stories that I had read hundreds of times sometimes. But then, as I envisioned God as the artist moving his brush, the meanings began to change. What if every verse of hopelessness, of darkness, of doubt, is just God using the dark colors to begin with to add to his masterpiece? What if every verse of blessing and victory are the bright colors that are being splashed onto the canvas? The verses we just read today, they set the stage for the most beautiful piece of art ever created. Jesus knelt down that night in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing, knowing that he was going to be arrested and killed. And, and as, he, as he prayed, he prayed with the knowledge of God's plan. And his natural desires to want what was best for him were so grueling that we're told that as he was there in the garden, he began to sweat blood. It was as if God, at that moment, as he was painting the most beautiful masterpiece ever, began to brush the top with some red and it began to drip down. And three different times Jesus begged God to come up with a new plan. But God wasn't going to budge on this one. Three times he prayed. And I'm glad that God didn't change the plan that night. I'm glad that God knows what's best, even when I'm convinced that my plan is better. And what I love about this, this honest, vulnerable look into the prayer life of Jesus is that during his most difficult moment, it reminds me that prayer isn't as much about the outcomes as it is about honest dialogue with God. Tell God how you feel when you pray. Abraham Lincoln once said, I have been driven many times to my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. Venting. Being honest with God is part of our prayer life. Talking about your anger, your sadness, your anxiety, your disappointment, your worry, your joy, your fear, all of that should be part of your prayer life. In fact, the Bible is filled with men and women who were raw and honest with God about how they were feeling in that moment. It's okay to go before God in prayer when you don't have it all together, when life has beat you down, when you're angry, when you're frustrated, when you're burnt out, and when you're just plain lost. Be honest with God about that. One of the names 
that is given to Jesus in the Old Testament prophecies comes from Isaiah 9-6. You'll know this passage. It says, For a child is born to us, a son unto us is given. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called what? A wonderful counselor. Prayer is the best counseling session that money can't buy. Right? Now, I'm not saying that, that prayer will answer everything, or certainly will turn out the way that you want or expect it to every time. But prayer can help you deal with a lot of things, that's for sure. And so often, we don't start there, do we? We don't turn to our wonderful counselor, right? In fact, Frequently, God is our last line of defense, isn't he? You know what I'm talking about, right? It's that Hail Mary prayer right before that test that you forgot about, right? Oh, there was a test today. Dear God, right? Am I the only one who's prayed that prayer? Many times, right? But we don't turn to our wonderful counselor. When we mess up our relationships, when we make a mess out of our lives, when something gets the best of us, and so often we forget and we fail to turn to God in prayer. You see, God already knows our situation. He's been there before. Who better to turn to in our time of need? I mean, seriously, if you've been struggling with something, do you really have somebody better to turn to? Now, I'm not saying counseling is bad, but maybe save yourself a little bit of money and start with God first. Maybe you're like me. Maybe you you don't always know what to pray, right? That's okay. Be present with God anyhow. Because you see, sometimes sitting silent with God is prayer. You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to get all the words right. You just need to be present with the Lord. Prayer is not just asking for something. Prayer is that longing of the soul. It's a a daily admission of our personal weakness. And it's better to go to God and have a heart without words And simply be there present than to go to God with words and not have your heart in it. God is listening. And He knows when we come to Him what our struggles and our pains are. Thinking back on our story here, Jesus prayed for an hour, but we only have that one line recorded, that one line that he prayed that night. And my suspicion is, we only have this one line that Jesus prayed because he kept praying it over and over again. We see at least three times he prays the same prayer. And I can imagine him down on his knees there in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing what the next day is going to bring, knowing in just a a matter of moments he's about to be arrested. Just praying again and again, Lord, Lord, if there's another way, I I, I will be obedient, but if there's another way. When you do pray, pray more than just that single hair Mary, right? Don't just pray that one prayer as your final throw up to God and you throw your hands in air and just kind of give up at that point. Don't stop praying. Pray until you have peace. See, it took Jesus three tries to get there. If it took him three tries to get there, we can't expect one last-ditch effort on our part to be the magic bullet to solve our problems. Pray until you have peace, and then when you lose it, start to pray again. Sometimes that may be hourly. Sometimes that may be daily. But whenever you feel anything other than peace start slipping back in, start praying again. Following God isn't always easy, folks. Being being obedient to God doesn't always come naturally. And at times it can be very, very scary. 
But it's in those very times where we need to pray through and know that God always wants what's best for us and that He is working all things for the good who love Him. Trust God. He'll see you through to the end. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, we again are so thankful that you are a God who hears us, a God who knows us, a God who goes before us, a God who, who has been and will and continue to be in relationship with us. And God, what that means for us is that when we're struggling, when we're doubting, when we're hurting, when we feel lost, that you are still there anyhow. What a wonderful comfort that is. And God, so often, too frequently, we, we don't turn to you first. Instead, you are our last line of defense. And God, you want more of a relationship with us than just that. And so God, I pray on this day that you would shine your love into our hearts and show us the ways and places where we might turn to you sooner, rely upon you more, to trust in you. Because God, you want what is best for us at all times. God, make our hearts to match your heart. Guide us in this, Lord. Strengthen us. And on the other side of it, as we are obedient to you, then may we see your abundant blessing. Lord, truly you are good and we are thankful. We are so glad that you are part of so many of our lives. God, we continue to pray on this day and lift up to you on our Memorial Day weekend. Uh, those who have gone before us and, and sacrificed on our behalf, we, re we rejoice for the freedoms that we enjoy and the peace that we can have. God, thank you for so many who have done so much. May we not forget that nor take it for granted. And most of all, thank you for Jesus who died on the cross for us, gave his life for us broken sinners, that we might be reconciled with you. Truly, God, that is the best news of all time. We thank you for your love. We thank you for all that you have blessed us with. And as we go forth this week, Lord, may we go forth restored, renewed, reinvigorated, that we might go forth as ambassadors of light and love into this world, sharing that with all we may come into contact with. God, thank you. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need some prayer today, we will have a prayer team here at the front. Come on forward and they would love to pray with you. Otherwise, be blessed. Have a safe rest of your weekend. Go and serve your King. Thanks for joining us. Amen.